Okay, thank you all for being here. We are so excited for this, our very first online workshop through the National Orphan Train Complex. My name is Kaylee Carson. I am the curator at the National Orphan Train Complex. Um, and our presenter tonight is Greg Markway. And I'll introduce him real quick and then we'll just let him get started. So Greg is a clinical psychologist from Jefferson City, Missouri. And his grandfather rode the orphan train from the New York Foundling Hospital in New York City to central Missouri in 1901. Greg used his DNA test results to identify his grandfather's parents. Um, and Greg is also the co-founder of the Facebook group Orphan Train DNA. And if you are not a part of that group, I would definitely recommend it. It's a great resource. Um, and that group is to help descendants look for their ancestors. Um, Greg also has a blog where he writes about Orphan Train history and provides tips on how to research your Orphan Train ancestors and genealogy just in general. So Greg, go ahead and get started. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um... Very happy to be here. I did a version of this presentation last summer at the National Orphan Train Complex at their annual celebration. And if any of you have any interest at all, I really encourage you to go this year. And if you go to the National Orphan Train Complex Facebook page, you can learn more about that. It's the first weekend in June, I believe. Um, it was really meaningful to be there. I felt like I learned a lot, but the thing that was most valuable was talking to other orphan train descendants. Okay, now as I get started here, um, okay, I started searching for my grandfather's origins in 2017. Um, growing up, I knew that my grandfather had ridden on the orphan train, but I didn't think a lot about it. Um, you know, like a lot of kids, you know, we're more focused on our own lives. And then as we grow older, we wish we could have asked more questions of our ancestor. Now, my grandfather situation was a little bit different than many. Um, he was five years old, so he remembered having been on the orphan train. He knew that all along. Whereas a lot of kids from the New York Foundling uh, are on the orphan train around the age of three, and they may not remember it. Um, a few other things unusual in my grandfather's situation were that he was one of 37 kids who all came to one small town in central Missouri at the same time. So, you know, imagine 37 kids coming to an area with a population of about 300. And that's a huge impact. You know, the next year at the school, there are a lot of new kids. Um, so he maintained contact with a lot of those other writers throughout his entire life. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is his name tag that he wore on the train. Um, it's faded a bit, you know, it's kind of like some staining on it now. But his last name was supposedly... Aner, A-N-E-R. I used to be able to read that on this name tag. Um, however, it's like, okay, Aner was his legal name. That's what he was given at birth, but that had nothing whatsoever to do with his genetic origins. His mother was not an Aner. His father was not an Aner. And in fact, that name is incredibly rare. So I wasn't sure where they even came up with that. Um, later, I found records indicating that his name was Joseph Auer, A-U-E-R. Um, I'll probably never know for sure what it was. Uh, different records has, have his name differently. Now, other than knowing that he came on the orphan train in 1901, we knew nothing else about his origins. Um, I was able to find, okay, I knew the date that the orphan train came and I found this photo from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. The train had stopped in St. Louis before coming on to central Missouri. And my grandfather was one of the oldest kids on that train at the age of five, all the others were younger. 
I suspect that the guy in the very front of this picture may be my grandfather, but I'll probably never be able to prove it. Okay, just another little bit about my grandfather. This is a picture of him in his foster or adoptive family, whatever we want to call it. He's in the back row on the left. And as you can see of all the young men in this family, it does appear that his genetics may be a little bit different than the rest. Okay, now just some general rules as far as DNA testing. Where to begin is a common question. And I would always recommend starting with ancestry DNA. And if you can afford to, to also test with 23andMe. Ancestry DNA has by far the largest database. Um, I can't remember the last number I heard for Ancestry. It may be up to about 20 million. I have to check to be sure. But that is a lot of people that have tested there. 23andMe uh, has fewer, but you never know where you're going to find your matches. I know um, the co-leader of the Orphan Train DNA group, uh, Ann Flaherty, her mother uh, came to Iowa from the New York Foundling Home, and she found her strongest matches on 23andMe, even though you get a much smaller number of matches there. So uh, another reason we recommend testing at those two places and not at the bottom two, at least as far as your basic DNA test, is that you can take your DNA file from Ancestry or 23andMe. So you can download it to your own computer and then you can upload it. So basically you can transfer it to MyHeritage and Family Tree DNA at either no cost or very little cost. Uh, they sometimes keep changing the rules on that. So I always say there may be a small cost, um, but sometimes it's no cost. Um, so I want to give an example, Ancestry DNA. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a couple slides here, if I can find it. It may be more than I was thinking. I'll come back to these. Oh, well, I'll, I'll go back. I may have to repeat myself, but on Ancestry, I've got about 50,000 DNA matches. So that is a huge number. On 23andMe, they limit you to about 5,000 DNA matches unless you pay an extra fee. You can get more, but usually at that point, those matches are so distantly related to you, it's not all that helpful. Um, okay, one thing I'll mention about my heritage DNA. My heritage tends to have a lot of people from Europe who test there. So it can be very helpful to put your DNA there. You're likely to get different matches, find different relatives there. Um, family tree DNA has some unique benefits and very specific circumstances that I will mention a little bit later. Okay, I've been using the term DNA match so let's first, I want to make sure we all understand what a DNA match is. Okay, a DNA match is another person who has taken the same DNA test that you have, and they share some of the same DNA with you, which basically means you are related to some degree. So as I mentioned here on Ancestry, I had over 40,000, I think it's up to about 60, that 50 or 60,000 total DNA matches now. Um, so when you hear that number, you may feel kind of overwhelmed. Uh, you may have felt overwhelmed if you've already taken the test and you've you know, gotten your re results. You just see all these people and you don't know who they are and you're like, what the heck am I supposed to do with this? Okay, now one thing that is helpful is that 
matches are displayed according to how much DNA they share with you. So basically you can have, for example, Ancestry um, sort your matches by how closely related they are to you. Uh, so one thing, like when you first look at your DNA results is just to see, do you recognize any of your matches? So if you can recognize any of your DNA matches, you can then start doing sorting of your matches, which basically means you can start putting them in a category. Did this come from my, is this person related to me through my mom or through my dad? And through that, you can start determining, okay, all these people are on my paternal side, all these are on my maternal side. Now that's really important because that's how you start searching for your ancestors. So for example, for me, my grandfather is my father's father. So I was looking for any matches that were on my father's side. Now I was fortunate because I knew my father's mother's side was very easy to identify. Um, uh, and I, I'm gonna show you something here. Let's see, okay. This is how it shows up on Ancestry now. Um, and you'll see I have matches sorted according to maternal and paternal. Now, I did not go through all 17,000 matches on my mom's side. Actually, I probably did, but I didn't label them all, <laughs> okay? They, um, Ancestry now has this thing. You'll see over where my cursor is now, where it shows the ethnic inheritance that can come from one side of your family or the other. Now, one thing I had been able to determine, and I think my grandfather had known this, was he was of Irish background. And down here under paternal, this huge green thing is the Irish DNA that my father had. It, okay, I'm gonna take a step back. This stuff, um, can sound way more complicated than it is. And I'm afraid if I keep going, I'm gonna make it more complicated than it is. But basically there are ways that if you can label some of your top matches as being either maternal or paternal, Ancestry can then help you sort the rest of your matches. And I'm not gonna go into great detail on that because I'll probably just confuse everybody, including myself but I can offer more help to people on this sort of thing through our Orphan Train DNA Facebook group. So we'll be coming back to this. Okay. Now you will notice that they show 17,000 matches on my maternal side and about 6,000 on my paternal side. You might wonder why is this huge difference? Well, I can tell you one of the reasons is that my mother's side of the family um, came to this continent in the 1600s. Uh, so they were here before there was a United States. Uh, most of them were in Pennsylvania. There were uh, Scottish Mennonites who came from Switzerland uh, to avoid persecution. And there were a lot of Quakers who came to Philadelphia. Uh, so they've been here a long time and they've had large families. Whereas on the paternal side of my family, my father's grandfather came from Germany in about 1860. So that was the first person on his side of the family. So they've only been here about 160 years. Whereas on the other side, it's about 400 years. So that alone can make up the, the difference. Okay, now getting back to the basic DNA stuff. Okay, one thing you can do on Ancestry, um, and you can do this on some other sites now, 
is when you start sorting your matches, you can begin very basically just, for example, you can say, I'm going to give all my mom's side a pink dot and all my dad's side a blue dot. There are things you can click on, which I will show you here. Okay, I'm just going to uh, Okay. Oh, of course, ancestry slow here. I'll, I'll come back to this. But basically what you can do is you can click on a dot to give them a color. So it's like basically it's just a way of sorting your matches. And eventually you can then start getting more refined. So like if you're able to figure out Okay, this is on my paternal side, but I now know who the mother of my grandfather was. I then know the rest of these on that I can't place are probably on the paternal side for my grandfather. Um, when I first began doing this, I just did it on paper uh, because it was easier. But then as I got more comfortable, there were so many matches, I was able to then start doing it on the computer. Okay, this is a picture of a couple relatively close relatives. The one at the top, Gary Ferguson, I knew him. He's my first cousin. I grew up with him. We went to the school together. We played on the same baseball teams as kids, et cetera. So it's like I knew who he was, but when I clicked on his name and then clicked on shared matches, there was also this other person Marguerite Olson. I had never heard of her, but she's pretty close. Um, you see, this right here is really key, where it says 635 CM. CM stands for centimorgan. You don't really need to know what it means other than that is a measure of how much DNA. And the higher the number, the more you share with this person. Now, 635 centimorgans is generally in the area of being a first cousin. It could be some other relationships, but that's about how close it's going to be. Something roughly equivalent to a first cousin. So Marguerite down here again is relatively close, but I didn't know her. I was eventually able to figure out that she was the daughter of my father's aunt. So she was my father's first cousin. So she's a first cousin one time removed from me. Um, got a little excited when I first saw that name because there's a question of who had a baby that we didn't know about. <laughs> That's a common thing that gets people looking when they're searching for family. Um, Okay, so here you can see um, uh, the dots I have for Gary Ferguson. And what these dots represent is, okay, the green one is that he matches my grandfather's mother and kind of the orange one was that he matches my grandfather's father as well. Okay. So like with Gary Ferguson, what I did, okay, I click on shared matches because he's a paternal first cousin and the family side I'm looking for is on my paternal side. So anybody else who matched Gary Ferguson and matched me, they're connected through my grandfather. Gary's mother was my dad's sister. So anybody who connects with us points straight up to my grandfather and his ancestors. So that was my target group where I was looking for, okay, who connects through my grandfather? Now, things got very confusing for me when I started going through shared matches. And I've since found out this is a common thing 
because when I started going through every shared match, then all of a sudden I'm finding some people who also match on my mother's side. Now this doesn't mean that my dad and mom were related, but what it does mean is that in the distant past, there are places where family lines overlapped. And some of these I will never figure out, but they do, okay. Now, but in general, I found two primary groups for my grandfather and I was able to sort them. So once I was able to start separating those, I could start trying to figure out who might be my grandfather's parents. Okay. Um, okay. Earlier when I was showing you uh, Gary Ferguson and like that he shared 635 Cinder Morgans of DNA with me. On Ancestry, if you click on where it says 635 CM, up will pop this screen. And this shows you what the potential relationships are between you and this other person. Now, as you can see, there's a long list overall. But what they are is things like first cousin, great grandparent, great grandchild, grand aunt, grand uncle, first cousin, one time removed. You can go on down the list, but they are sorted in order of probability. Um, but this is just really useful to know because it gives you ideas for where to start hypothesizing this person might fit in your family tree. Okay, here are a couple other people who showed up as matches to me through my grandfather, somehow his family, but I had no idea who they were. Now over on the right, you will see it says in black common ancestor. That pops up now because I was able to fill out the family tree and then ancestry automatically finds who your common ancestor is. If they have a family tree filled out and you have one filled out. So it's not necessarily telling you anything new, but it's sort of a quick thing you can click on when you're working on your family tree. But okay, so the first person here, this Pamela, I had no idea who she was. You can see over on the right, she does have a family tree. And when I clicked on that, I still had no idea how we were related. But when I looked at the next person down, this Southern man, um, interesting name for someone from New York, okay. Um, he had a private tree, which I wasn't able to see, but I wrote Pamela because I started having a theory of how we might be connected because there were other shared matches that already had a family name showing up in it. A family name of Van Sten was showing up in shared matches. I wrote Pamela and asked her, are you related to anyone named Van Sten? She wrote back and said, Yes. Okay. So, okay. That gave me a clue, but it wasn't real helpful. We sort of communicated. And I think we were kind of feeling each other out a little bit. Like, what do you know? Why are you asking? And finally I said, my grandpa was on an orphan train. It appears that somebody named Van Sten is connected to him, but I'm not sure. And when I said that, she then started sharing a bunch of information. She really wanted to be helpful. She was wonderful. I ended up meeting her. I flew out to Colorado and stayed with her for a few days. She was an amazing woman. Um, okay, then Southern man, I could tell he was related fairly closely to Pamela. Those two didn't know each other, but it turns out they were second cousins. They shared a great grandparent and then they ended up meeting each other too because I put them in contact with each other. So I was the one who was able to tell them how they were related. Kind of funny how this works. Okay, as I started working on the family tree for the Van Sten family, 
I worked back and I found this couple that was pretty clear that I had descended from them. I had a lot of people who were who matched my DNA and also descended from this couple. Um, you look at that name, you might think uh, Mr. Van Sten was Dutch. It turns out, no, he's Irish. Um, his name was originally V-A-N-S-T-O-N, all one word. He, he, or his parents moved to England. He was born in England and then came to the United States, at which point, well, in England, they misspelled the name and it became E-N, all one word. Got to the United States, as they made it two words. Um, I think somebody at the Census Bureau made it uh, two words. The census taker wrote it down this way and they just started using it that way. But I've seen it spelled all different ways in records since then. Okay, so I'm thinking one of Richard's kids is one of my grandfather's parents. So what we have here, I'm just showing three of Richard's kids. Okay, Richard Jr. can't be it. He only lived for four years. Catherine Van Sten is a possibility. She lived for 65 years. And then we've got this George Van Sten over here who lived for oh, 68 years. So these are two possibilities, but I have no idea, you know, is one of these my grandfather's mother or is the other one my grandfather's father? I had no way to know at this point. But what I then did something with DNA, which it's not often helpful, but I got lucky. <laughs> okay, there's a thing called Y DNA. And a test for that is only available through family tree DNA. And it's very expensive, but I was desperate and I spent the money. Y DNA is something that is only passed down from father to son. So my Y DNA would go back to my dad, my grandfather, my great grandfather, my great great grandfather. So basically the whole line of men going back. Sometimes people take this test looking for a family name when they have no idea. When you take this test, you find out how few, how many people were born outside of marriage. So for example, your first name that shows up at the match is Fuge, then Davis. But then look at these last two, Van Stone. It's not Van Sten, but it's Van Stone. And it's close enough that that seemed like a reasonable hypothesis that those people are all related on my, to my grandfather. So the Van Stone, Van Sten, I assumed that it must be George Van Sten, who is my great grandfather. Now I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit and we're gonna have plenty of time for questions, I believe, after this. But using the same sort of thinking where I'm looking at matches and looking at the family trees of matches and going back farther and farther, I was able to find this Abigail Camille Doyle. It took me forever to find her because, and I, I wanna give a little background here. At one point in all my searching, my brother said, well, I remember grandpa saying that his mom was Abby Doyle. And I always tease my brother that he is such a talker, he can't ever keep a secret, but he didn't tell me this till I was nearly two years into my search. Well, I started searching for Abby Doyles and that is such a common name that was not very helpful. But eventually I did find this match in the family trees of my DNA connections. And the DNA connections I had were as close as about um, 100 centimorgans, I'll say in that area, which could be like a third cousin, but my matches turned out to be half second cousins. 
So I had other people who descended from Abby Doyle, but they had a different father than my grandfather did. Now, through a lot of research, well, I, I want to take a step back. First of all, when I, when I found this Abby Doyle, it's like in my heart, I knew I'd found the right person. I, it's hard to explain, but it just hit me. This has to be her. But you'll notice where she was born in Massachusetts. She did not live in New York to, I don't know if she lived in New York when my grandfather was conceived or not. I don't know. Or if it had been in Massachusetts. It's interesting in my research, I found that my grandfather's father, he worked primarily in a family business in Brooklyn and then later in Philadelphia. But there was a period of time that he was a traveling salesman. So if you wanna go with any of the old jokes, they may fit. Um, so I do not know how these two met or where they met, um, but where she lived in Western Massachusetts around Springfield, Holyoke, um, which also is not very far from Hartford, Connecticut, it is not a long trip to New York City from there. So even back at that time, there were trains. She probably could have been in New York City within about three hours. Okay. Um, okay, let's go back here. Okay, I wanna briefly talk about how to approach DNA matches when you're trying to get information. I feel like I've, ex I don't know, experimented with a lot of different things. You'll get a lot of different advice saying, don't tell them exactly why you're looking in the beginning. Um, you know, a lot of times I ended up just saying, I see that we're connected. Um, it appears it may be through my father's side. Um, I would like to explore this more with you. Sometimes I did that and I might get an initial response, but I did not wait very long before ever saying something about my grandfather. I didn't want to feel like I was being tricky. Um, and I'll be honest, I did have some good responses mentioning the orphan train. I think some people were sort of intrigued by that history. And I would always tell people where I lived and I would always give them my email address because people are very suspicious nowadays and I wanted them to be able to look me up on Facebook. I wanted them to be able to Google me. Um, I would tell them something about myself so that I didn't sound as much like a scammer, hopefully. <laughs> um, and I've gotten lots of interesting responses. I found, I found a woman who was born in England and she was on kind of an English version of an orphan train, although she went on a ship to Australia as a child and she got taken in by a family there. That was one of the more interesting ones that I found. Um, one thing I found a lot of people know nothing about their family when I contact them. I know more than they do. Um, so again, I just wanna come back and summarize a little bit. Part of what you do with DNA is you find out as much information as you can about your closest matches and you try to build family trees going back for them. So some people have a family tree on their ancestry profile and that makes it easy. Some people do not. I, I recently found some relatively close relatives, again, about a third cousin and their last name was Doyle, but I couldn't figure out who they were. But I was able to go back and Google through old newspapers and I found obituaries where I was eventually able to piece together who they were and how we're related. It's interesting because I find a lot of mistakes in other people's family trees because I've done so much research. Um, 
Okay, so that is some general ideas. Now, I, I want to give an example of other things I later found related to my grandfather, and this is bizarre. Okay, down in the right-hand um, corner here, the lower corner, I was able to find his birth certificate, and I ordered this um, from New York Records. And it's you'd have to turn it sideways to read it, but it lists his parents as being Adelaide Hour for a mother and Joseph King for a father. I've only found one person in all my genealogy research named Adelaide Hour. I'm sure there have been others, but I only found one and she wasn't even in New York. So how that they chose that name to hide their identity, I don't know. Um, Joseph King surprisingly was a relatively rare name in New York at this time. Um, you know, it's basically a common first name, a common last name, but it wasn't around New York a lot. Um, I did lots of searching looking for Aner and Hour, uh, taking a lot of time. And one thing I've learned is don't focus too much on the name, uh, especially if they came from the New York family. There's, some kids had an original name because a parent dropped that child off at the family and said, this is, I'm so-and-so and this is my child and I may come back someday, please keep track of them. Uh, other people were dropped off anonymously uh, or just you know, left in the basket outside the family uh, where the caretakers found a baby. Um, children from Children's Aid Society are more likely to know their names because they were more likely to come to the Children's Aid Society at an older age. Although there were a number of foundlings who ended up there too. Babies that were found who nobody knew their parents and they were brought there as well. So you can keep the name in the back of your mind and you can look for that name among your matches. But if you don't find it, don't despair. You can still find answers. Now, my grandfather died in 1970. I found his parents in 2019, so it took me about two years. Um, a year ago, a little more, I had another uh, elderly family member uh, who passed away. And my cousin, Gary Ferguson, gave me a box full of stuff that used to belong to my grandfather that they found. And in it, this letter on the left from 1926. So my grandfather would have been 30 years old at the time. Oh, actually this letter's from 1927. Uh, kind of amusingly, the date at the top, the year is wrong. It was early in January and the person who typed it up forgot to make it 1927 instead of 1926. Uh, so the same mistakes I make all the time they were making back then. But this is a letter that my grandfather got, he was hounding the New York family, apparently. And he finally got this letter. It said, you were brought here on May 13th, 1896. So two weeks after he was born, he was brought there by a woman, his mother named Abby Doyle. So I found her name. I found out who she was before I had this information. I spent all this time looking for my grandfather's mother. And there was a part of me that felt like I was doing this for him. I felt like that since I had the ability, it was almost my duty to find an answer for him. I later found out that he had an answer. So he had mentioned her name to my brother but he never wanted to talk about her in any other way because I think he felt so hurt that he was left at an orphanage. Now, since I started this research, I have found a lot of info about Abby. Okay, so she was about uh, 20, 23 years old when my grandfather was born. I have found newspaper records from where she lived in Massachusetts. About four months prior to my grandfather's birth, a newspaper story saying she was leaving for New York where she was studying to be a nurse. So there were newspaper stories that verified she was in Massachusetts 
but was going to New York. I learned a lot more about Abby through my research. Her father died when she was eight years old. That same year, her mother had surgery for cancer. So if you think about this in 1881, surgery for cancer must have been really brutal. And I later found an obituary of her mother saying she was never the same after having that surgery. So Abby was eight years old. Her dad was gone. Her mom was probably emotionally gone. So I was able to develop, in a sense, some sympathy for her, some sympathy I'm sure my grandfather didn't have um, because he had so much hurt. But I feel like I was able to put together a broader story and I'm far enough removed from it. I wasn't the one who was left at an orphanage. I understand why my grandfather felt what he did. I mean, as a kid, how else could you feel? I probably understand why Abby would leave him at an orphanage as a single mother with from a relatively poor family. You know, with no support from her own parents, I mean, how is she? She going to take care of a child. You can't get a job back then as a woman other than as a housekeeper or a teacher or a nurse uh, or working in a factory. But none of them would really allow for you to have a child there. And it's not like there's a daycare at every corner. So it's there's this whole story that develops as well. Now, There's so much more I can say, but I want to be able to answer questions about your cases. Um, but I also kind of want to show this. Okay, in the front row on the right, that is Abby Doyle, a year after my grandfather was born. A relative shared this photo with me. Once I made connections with people, they were, I found people very happy to share. I was fortunate. I, when I reached out to them, they were open to the story. Um, and when I saw this picture of Abby, the first thing, the first reaction I had is like, oh my gosh, my dad looks like her. Um, so there's Abby. And her two, well, two brothers in the back and one brother uh, on the left seated. Uh, that brother died not long after this. He had diabetes, um, did not, you know, back then uh, there was not a lot of treatment. Um, the, I was able to date the photo because of the two kids. So, um, this is Abby going back, visiting her family in Massachusetts. Um, I'm looking to go to Massachusetts this fall, uh, meeting up with at least a couple of the relatives. And there's a third one in Rhode Island, who's kind of the family genealogist, uh, historian who may come as well. So it may end up as kind of a mini family reunion in Massachusetts. And I'm, I'm just hoping to visit some of the places where they live. They used to have a farm, uh, probably where this photo was taken. And I believe it is still farmland. I'm, at least, I'm hoping. Um, so here are some other pictures of Abby at various stages of her life. And I want to show you this one in particular. It's my grandfather on the left and Abby on the right. And if I were to ask you what about them looks similar, uh, many people say the nose. Uh, it's a rather prominent nose. Um, so I don't know. There, there is an emotion that came over me being able to see them together. Now, this is a photo of Catherine Van Sten. So she would have been my grandfather's aunt. I got this photo from the relative I met who lives in Colorado. So it, I know the talk is about DNA, but the reason we're searching goes just beyond filling in names on a family tree. It's like, we wanna feel some connection. That's why we're searching. We wanna honor, honor our ancestor, 
another reason we're searching. And in some ways, finding any answers also just kind of validates our own life experience. You know, as a psychologist, and I, this word may feel more strong than how you feel, I don't know. But there is a certain trauma that comes for some people when they're adopted, or at least they don't know their family of origin. Um, and I know my grandfather felt that because he did talk about that. That's why he was searching for his parents 30 years later. He just wanted to know. And I, I think for me, it was helpful to find some answers just to know. When I was studying to become a psychologist, I did my dissertation on how a family influences your sense of identity, how your family helps you, I don't know, feel good as to who you are. And actually, as I say that, you know, it's so obvious to me, it was not a coincidence that that's what I ended up studying as a psychologist. Okay, you do get some surprises because here is my father's half first cousin with Elvis. Um, this is Kitty Dolan. Abby Doyle married a man named William Dolan and then they both lived in New York. He was an attorney and she did well. Um, I mean, the family had struggles. They went through the depression like everybody else. But Abby's granddaughter, Kitty Dolan, she did very well for a period of time. She had her own show in Las Vegas. She was a stage actress. She starred as Daisy May in Little Abner. Um, and she was a singer. She sort of did it all. And she dated Elvis for a significant period of time, right before he went into the army. Um, but these were some photos taken as publicity photos at various times. Um, so it's just kind of, it was fun to see that. Um, I, sh I should note though that Kitty later dropped out of performing after she got married because her husband had uh, younger siblings and the parents had both died and she helped raise them. Uh, so a lot of stories that I learned. Anyway, I want to come back to just like in conclusion. If you don't belong to our Facebook group, Orphan Train DNA, please apply. Uh, you know, just click that you want to become a member. Um, we help people find their ancestry and we guide them through how to use DNA and other uh, devices to find your ancestry. You might also consider joining a Facebook group called DNA Detectives. Um, that group has more than 100,000 members of people looking for answers and helping other people find answers. They specialize in how to interpret. That's where I learned what I needed to find my grandfather's parents. And it's where I learned what I'm talking about tonight and how uh, me and other people in the group help others. Also, I do a lot of writing uh, on my blog. You can look at gregmarkway.com. I use some other names for it, but that's an easy one to remember. Hopefully soon I'll get orphantraindna.com connected to it. Uh, so it'll be easy to find. Um, so anyway, I think I will stop here because uh, I can talk forever, but I want to see what else people want to ask about. So I'm um, trying to figure out how to uh, see if I can stop my sharing so that I can see other people's faces. Perfect. Okay. And, and you can also drop questions in the chat box right along the bottom of your screen, or just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Greg any questions that you've got. So, anybody have anything right now? Okay. And if you think of anything later that you want to ask, 
You can also uh, message me on Facebook or you can also, uh, I was going to get my email address, but since this is going to go on YouTube, I don't want to do that because I get enough spam as it is. But if you message me on Facebook and you've got a lot to say, I can send you my email address as well. So we have a question in the comments, or I guess a, a topic in the comments. Um, B. Blinka is wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the importance of overlapping DNA. Um, so maybe a little bit more about, you know, that, that key, um, your, your yeah. cousin being a key piece in kind of uncovering all of this. Yeah, I, okay, I think she may be asking about what I said about how I found some relatives that match in multiple different ways. And I will say that I'm lucky that most of that is extremely distant connections. So it was not that significant. So the, it's bizarre because I, I found one person recently that matches three of my four grandparents lines. Um, now, one thing I've discovered that I never knew from doing all my research is that um, my mother has a small number of, she has one line of Irish relatives. Uh, their name was O'Rourke in the United States it eventually became Roark uh, and there's different ways it's spelled. Um, but so that may be how some connect. It's like it's way back in Ireland, but it's so distant and it hasn't been a major problem. Now, another thing regarding overlapping DNA is there are rare examples uh, in certain populations. If you have a lot of French Canadian, for example, or a lot of Cajun ancestry, it can get really, really difficult because everybody's related to everybody else 20 different ways. Um, that is not common, but it does happen. Okay. I think I saw another question in the chat just pop up. Um, okay. The site for the expensive DNA test. Um, it's family tree DNA. Um, so it's ftdna.com. Um, and if you have questions about that particular test, you're thinking of doing it, feel free to message me on Facebook because there are ways to perhaps minimize your expense starting out at least. You can test at different levels, like kind of a general level, a really specific level, and that one gets really expensive. So you can start at the less expensive one and you might find an answer there. Okay. Um, Okay, any other questions anybody has? I just have a quick comment. Um, if anyone doesn't have Facebook, if you want to send us an email at the Orphan Train Complex, I'll put our email in the chat because that's all over the internet anyway. Um, and then I can put you in touch with Greg through email that way so that you can contact him through email. If you don't have Facebook, just reach out to us and we'll put, we'll put you in touch. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, and I know uh, in talking, it's possible that you'll be thinking right now, okay, this kind of makes sense. And then as soon as you leave this, you might um, forget everything. That's how my brain works when I attend these things. Um, on my blog, if you look through it, I basically have all this information written down in kind of a step-by-step -step manner of how you can do this. Um, and okay, I see there's a, another question here about how did I get the birth certificate from New York? Um, Okay, I'm trying to, there, okay, how I did it, there were a couple places I found the information so that I could send for it. Um, one was on the familysearch.org website. Okay, I'd been searching for Aner forever and not finding anything. 
But then I was able to do a search with um, typing in, well, I've been searching for Aner, but then eventually I had a reason why I tried Hour and it popped up. And when I saw the date, it was one day off from what my grandfather used to think his birth date was. So I was thinking, and then when I tried to search for the parents' names and couldn't find them anywhere, I thought, I bet this is it. Uh, and then it turns out elsewhere, I was able to confirm that that was his birth record. Um, now, I can see the question is like that you have a birth certificate, but it has very little information. Um, it just depends on what they put on it and depending on what year it was. Um, so for example, since it was 1896, that was long ago that all of this was public information. And I think in New York, you can get birth certificates. I'm not sure the date. I think it may be up till about 1912 or 1914 now that you can just send for it and get it. Okay. Let's see. I guess I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Um, now, uh, okay, I'm checking actually some more messages. Um, okay, yes, I want to comment on Okay, there's a comment that says, my great-grandfather came from the Children's Aid Society and my great-grandmother wrote a letter to them and she got a letter back that he was Armenian orphan dropped off and labeled John Doe number 35. And who would have gave him, oh, who would have given him the name of John Daring? He was seven on the train. There's a couple of possibilities. One is, if a baby was found in the street, depending on the year, but if a baby was found on the street, um, I believe it was around the year 1900, what would happen at that time, they would be taken essentially to the city children's family court. And at that court, they would alternate giving one kid to the family and one to the Children's Aid Society. One kid would be baptized Protestant, the other one would be baptized uh, Catholic, depending on which organization they were going to. Uh, so either the court or the orphanage would give a name. Sometimes the name would be given in honor of the person who found the person on the street, the baby on the street. Sometimes a name would be oh, we found them near Central Park, so we'll call them Joe Parks. Uh, things like this would happen. So the names could be fairly random. Um, or sometimes um, I've heard of a child being named after the priest who baptized the child. I, I've heard a full range of things. Similarly, um, we know at the foundling, we've got, we have a couple examples of children who were named after um, the sisters that worked at the foundling, or also um, I got a phone call from somebody last week who thought their ancestor might have been named after a saint. Um, so those are some other possibilities where those names could come from. Um, and sometimes children who were just John Doe's, um, they may not have received names until they got with their new families. And then those families, their adoptive families could have picked a name for them. Um, and that's what one of the things that makes researching orphan train riders particularly difficult or any adopted person particularly difficult because there's often these name changes. And that is where this DNA can be really helpful, though it can also be quite the process. Um, but it's definitely one of those great resources for those John Doe's, those Jane Doe's, those people who were not sure who they were. When they yeah, were and I think one, one thing I wanna add here at the end is, again, you can have a name in the back of your mind, but try not to be stuck and only searching on that name. Um, 
It's also possible that my grandfather had, had different names along the way. So I've, I've learned various other things. He probably rode the orphan train more than once. Um, he, he has memories of going to his either Iowa or Nebraska. And then the mother and the family died and he got sent back to the family. And then when he came to Missouri, the Markway family was not his first family in Missouri. So my, gr my grandfather went through at least three homes before he found his lasting home. Um, and I think another thing that I've learned in doing all this research is how connected we all are. And the best example of this I have is I, when I first found the answers, I was going to be doing a program at my local library. And as I was working on it, I had the most bizarre realization is that I found that I had a close relative who also descended from Abby Doyle. And this guy was born in New York, but he was now living in the same town I was in central Missouri. And I looked, I stalked everybody in his family on Facebook and I found his kids were going to the same high school I went to. So he was born in New York, but he ended up here as well. Uh, we're kind of becoming friends at this point. We meet for coffee now and then. And um, other than politics, we get along great. So, <laughs> but we enjoy it. We enjoy it. It's, it's just really bizarre to find connections like that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Greg. Um, just again, to reiterate, you can find Greg on Facebook. Um, he also is a member of a couple um, DNA groups on Facebook, um, the first one being Orphan Train DNA, um, and then DNA Detectives are two great resources on Facebook. Um, we are also on Facebook under National Orphan Train Complex. We'll continue to post events there. Um, this is the first Zoom meeting like this that we've ever done, but I think we had a pretty good turnout. Um, and so we hope to, to do more of these in the future. Um, so if you have topics or things you would like us to, to focus on for these, let us know. Um, we also have our upcoming celebration in June where we gather in Concordia and we talk more about orphan train history. Um, so feel free to reach out to us about that. Yes, Greg. And Kelly, yeah, I would... One last thing I want to say is um, I kind of see this uh, presentation as a beginning. And one thing I thought of doing, uh, and there would be some things we'd have to work out, but I thought of trying to see if we could do something to help some people who are just starting out with DNA. Like we could do like a short program, giving an example of actually doing it with someone as opposed to just looking at what I had already done. Um, I, I've got to work on the, the concept a little bit so I can explain it better, but um, we could either do that through the uh, orphan train complex or through the Facebook group, or we can figure out those details later. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, um, Greg. Feel free, anybody, feel free to reach out to us over email or Facebook. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you again on one of these or in person soon. So thank you all. Have a great night.